There are some people, some names, or some occupations that I think elicit in us, for better or worse, sort of this gut-level response when we hear. Like, for example, if I said to you, you know, what are you doing later today? And you said, I'm going to the dentist. I would probably have this, like, like there's like a reaction to that that we have about going to the dentist. Or, for example, if you say, oh, yeah, he's a used car salesman. That kind of elicits this emotional response in us. But again, there are some names that are like that as well. Like if I said Tony Romo, what do you think of when you think Tony Romo? You know, for some reason, there's like this, this cowboy fan gut level reaction one way or the other about Tony Romo. Or if you get a letter in the mail and it says IRS on there or DMV, you know, you just, oh, like you can kind of feel that internally inside of you. How about an occupation of prostitute? How does that land on you? What emotions do you feel when you hear that? What judgments do you make? Well, the writers of Scripture call attention specifically to this occupation when it talks about this woman we're going to talk about today in her faith, a woman by the name of Rahab. Again, we're walking through Hebrews chapter 11, and it's talking about by faith, how all of these great people did all of these things by faith. And it talks about Rahab, but she's not just Rahab, and she's not Rahab of Jericho. She is, very specifically, Rahab the prostitute, or your Bible might say Rahab the harlot. Her job was practically her last name. In fact, five out of the eight references to her as prostitute. This was this career choice that absolutely got stuck as a name to her. She had a reputation, she had this label, and it was incredibly difficult to shake. It defined her, it followed her around. And yet the story of Rahab the prostitute is so much more than the story of a prostitute. It is a story of God's amazing, immeasurable, incomparable grace that shows up so often in the most unexpected places. Let's read what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 has to say about Rahab. It starts the way it starts every verse in this chapter. It says, by faith, the prostitute, there it is, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Now, just a really quick overview, some context of Rahab. God had promised to bring the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, into the promised land, into the land of the Canaanites. He had promised them that centuries before this. But shortly after God brought his people out of Egypt, well, they weren't ready for Canaan just yet. They didn't trust his power. They didn't trust his love. And they started to complain. And because of that, God essentially made them punished by by wandering in the desert for 40 years. And then, under the leadership of Joshua, and that's the story that we looked at last week, through Joshua's leadership, he was going to give them another shot. So the whole nation of Israel, something like 2 million men, women, and children, are on the doorstep of Canaan. They're just across the Jordan River from Jericho. They're just about to enter into the land of promise. They're just about to have their inheritance. And in part of that process, there are going to be these spies that are sent out to spy out the very first city across the land, that city of Jericho that we talked about last week. Look at the text back in Joshua chapter 2, and let's pick up the story there. The Bible says this, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. He says, Go look over the land, especially Jericho, So they do so. It says, So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Dramatic chord, like collective gasp. What? I'm sorry, why are they going to this particular place? Why are they going to the house of a prostitute? A lot of times you, you, know, you read that sentence, they entered the house of Rahab the prostitute, and maybe you think that they were, uh, you kind of think the worst. Uh, but I believe by this time, they had actually learned their lesson. I think the Hebrews had learned their lesson from when the first time there were spies that were sent out to spy out Canaan. That famous story of, you know, the ten and the two, Ten of them came back and immediately they had said, there's no way, we have no chance against these people. And essentially they took one look at the people inhabiting the land and they said, nope, not going to happen. And again, because of their lack of faith, it was going to be a while until they got another chance. They shirked their duties. They got the Israelites, Israelites banished to the wilderness. And so Joshua is sending these two spies and they go into Rahab's and it's not for something profane. 
I want you to kind of think through logically. She is, by occupation, someone who knows a lot of people. A wide variety of people, and very likely some of the best connected people. And so there's probably a very specific reason why God sent these two spies specifically to Rahab's house. There's something providential in this. You know, she had connections. She knows the gossip. She knows the news. She knows the facts. These, these women, they know their city. Rahab's house, it was, a, it was a bit of an obvious choice, really, to get intel about this very formidable, formidable city of Jericho. And yet, even though Rahab was a Canaanite, living in a culture that God himself deemed detestable for their wicked and idolatrous ways, even though Rahab was a woman who had no legal standing and no rights among her people, and even though she was a prostitute, did I mention that part yet? Even though Rahab had all these things going against her, God deliberately leads these two spies to go and knock on her door because he had something else up his sleeve. Now, unfortunately, when they're there, they are spotted. Someone sees them at Rahab's house, and they go and they report their presence to the king. Pick up the story in verse 3 of Joshua chapter 2. It says, So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. That's a chilling message to get from the king. You are harboring spies, send them out. But look at the response, verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I don't know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You might catch up with them. Look at verse 6, the parenthetical. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. This begs the question, why? Why would Rahab chase? Why would she risk by lying to these government officials who certainly had the ability to put her to death if they found out. Why would she do this thing, especially for two invaders, two people who are literally coming to check out a city that they want to destroy, that they want to conquer? Why would she do that? Well, the text actually tells us why. Rahab tells us why. Look at verse 9. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear for you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt and what you did to, the, what to, what, what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. And when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. She says that twice. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God of heaven above and on earth below. Wow. I dare say nobody, not Joshua, not these two spies, nobody expected that confession of faith from a Canaanite prostitute. Your God is the God. You know, see, the battle of Jericho did not start out as a military conflict. It started out as a battle for the hearts and the minds of the people in the city. Apparently, that promise that was given to Abraham some 650 years before this, that one day his, in his, his uh, descendants would inhabit this land, apparently that promise, it was common knowledge among the Canaanites. And apparently, according to what she said, they had heard about the miracle of the exodus from Egypt. They had heard about the army of Egypt being swallowed up in the Red Sea. They heard about the military victories over the other hostile kings. They heard about all of it. And what happened is their hearts melted in fear, she says. Three times she talks about how afraid they were of these Israelites. So as two million Hebrews set up across the Jordan River, the people living in the promised land, they know exactly what their arrival means, and they were scared. And and Rahab makes sure that these spies understand how scared they are. But what they are doing is they're preparing for battle. They're trusting in a mighty wall. And instead, Rahab has a different response. She surrendered and she asked for protection. She appealed to the personal name 
of the God of Israel. And she made that declaration of faith. I want to show it to you again, verse 11. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, had seen the power of God at work. She believed in his existence and she confessed her faith in him. Rahab had found God. Or more precisely, God had found Rahab. So the spies had hoped to kind of sneak into Jericho and probably remain you know, undetected, but that's clearly not what happened. The, the spies' plan kind of crumbled, but God's going to work out an even greater plan. This plan to save an entire family, Rahab's entire family. They thought this was a reconnaissance trip, but instead it turned out to be a mission trip as they are essentially going to work a plan that's going to save Rahab and her family. Someone with a checkered past is going to have her entire household saved. To everyone's great surprise, God demonstrated that he can use anyone, even someone with as checkered a past as Rahab, as a part of his plan to bring his people into their new home. And to everyone's great surprise, God demonstrated that he can save anyone, even a foreigner, even a prostitute like Rahab. Rahab had everything going against her. Her gender, her occupation, her nationality, everything was going against her, but one thing was going for her that made all the difference. It was her faith. What does Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 say? By faith, Rahab. It was by faith. It made a tremendous difference. So she's having a conversation with these two spies. They're still in her home, and uh, they're kind of figuring out a plan. And after her confession of faith, she sort of bargains with them for the safety of her entire family. And the two spies arranged a signal for Rahab and her family. She was to tie a scarlet cord out her window so that when they rushed in to capture the city, they would know which apartment or which house was hers. And they made a deal to save everyone in the house. She said, if you want them saved, make sure they're in the house. If they're not, well, their, their blood is on, is on your hands. We can do nothing about it. But if, but if they're in the house, we assure you that they will be saved. And those two Hebrew spies, they honored that promise. They go back and they tell Joshua everything that had happened. And they talked about saving this family from the destruction. Last week, we read this in Joshua chapter 6. It says, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. And that's where we stopped last week. But you skip down a few verses and you see the rest of the story. It says, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and her sisters and all who belong to her. They brought out her entire family and they put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. And so Rahab was saved. She entrusted her safety and the safety of her family to the word of these Hebrew spies, and she entered into a life. She gave her whole life, really, to the God of the Israelites. You know, there's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And I want to make clear that Rahab was not just looking for fire insurance. She wasn't just trying to be spared from the inflicting conflict. She genuinely believed what she said. She wasn't just saying, you know, like, oh, your God is the God, the God of heaven above and, and earth below. She wasn't just saying that just to protect herself. She was saying that because she truly believed it. And you say, well, how do you, how do you know that? Well, because this is not the only few places the Bible talks about Rahab. There are two women specifically mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, and one of them, of course, is Rahab. But this is not the only place in the New Testament where Rahab is talked about. James, the brother of Jesus, also pays tribute to Rahab. He talks about faith, and he talks about Abraham's faith as an example, and then he goes on to say this in James chapter 2, verse 25. In the same way... Was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds 
is dead. The Bible makes very clear, if you want proof, if you want evidence of great faith in God, you have to look at what a person does. You have to look at a way a person lives. So I know that Rahab was not just saying that she believed in God. She actually believed in God. Why? Because of what she did. And that's what James says. Our faith should be demonstrated in how we live. What is the way you're living, what is it saying about your faith? Rahab's faith was was immediately put into action. Her trust in this God was immediately immediately, uh, put into action. You look at how Rahab cared for the spies. You looked at how she helped them escape. She had this incredible faith. A faith that not only saved herself, but saved her entire family. You know, last week we looked at we looked at this text where Joshua has the army march around the city of Jericho six times, you know, once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, seven times. And there's a part of you that just you, you gotta ask why. You know, and, and maybe it was psychological warfare, you know, that that very intimidating act of like not understanding what your enemy is doing. And maybe that was part of it, but but I want to think about something else as a possibility this morning. Could it be that the Lord gave Jericho six nights to sleep on their decision to oppose his people? Here's what I, I believe to my core. God would have honored 10,000 crimson cords hanging from 10,000 windows in Jericho. If he could find 10,000 people of faith, he would have honored that faith. And maybe because God is slow to anger and abounding in love, he was giving opportunity for more people to come to faith in him. He would have been delighted to have them acknowledge Israel's God as the one true God, just as Rahab had done. Six days passed, and Rahab was the only one. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He showers us with grace every day. But at some point, you have to acknowledge that faith in him, and you have to put it into action. You have to trust him, and you have to reach out and grab his outstretched hand for you. At some point, your faith will be evident in your actions, in the way that you live. At some point, your faith demands a response. When grace came knocking on her door, what does Rahab do? She hides these spies, she confesses her faith in God, and she ties that scarlet cord out her window, and then she leaves that life behind in the rubble of Jericho. She didn't look back, she turned, and she started in a completely new chapter in her life. A a, a remarkable, amazing new life. In fact, after those walls of Jericho crumble, the story of Rahab and her family actually continues in verse 25 of Joshua chapter 6. It says this, it says, Joshua spared Rahab had the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And look at the very next part of that verse. It says, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. What an interesting epilogue to her story. And then you fast forward about 1,400 years to the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew reveals that she did not just live on the outskirts of the Hebrew nation, on leftover milk and honey. In fact, she was right in the middle of all of it. There was a young man by the name of Salmon who saw in Rahab a woman of beautiful faith, and they got married. And Salmon and Rahab had a son whose name was Boaz. And Boaz would later marry a widow named Ruth, and they eventually became the great-grandparents of King David. And when Scripture mentions Rahab, as I said, she is so often called Rahab the prostitute, but not in Matthew's gospel. Matthew's genealogy just calls her the mother of Boaz. God redefined Rahab. From a fallen woman to a chosen woman. From a bad girl to a bride. From a mess to to a mother, and from a prostitute to the grandmother of the Messiah. It's quite a turnaround, isn't it? And what God did for Rahab, he does for us as well. 
God's grace redefines us. It relabels us. It gives us a new identity. The grace of God, it bridges the gap of who we are and who God wants us to be. And so often, a lot of us walk around life with these labels. Some of them are self-imposed, and some of them are given to us by others. Labels like failure, short-tempered, divorced, cheater, liar, addict, broken, depressed, defeated. And maybe you've kept your label hidden for a long time. Maybe you've made sure that the people of your past are separated from the people of your present because you're afraid they'll find out about your label. Or maybe your label is the exact reason why you keep your distance from God. Because after all, He's God. He knows everything. He knows who you really are. And since He knows who you really are and what you're really like, He wants to have nothing to do with someone like you. You know what I find interesting? Jesus spent His entire ministry hanging out with people who were carrying around awful labels. Labels like sinner and tax collector and adulterer. These are the people who are at the center of his ministry. Why? Because those are the exact kinds of people who need a Savior. Those are the exact kind of people who are thirsty for the grace of God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, to save you and to save me. And through his death and through his resurrection, our sins have been taken away. They're wiped out. They're gone. They're history. And the Bible tells us, therefore now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 tells us that. God's grace has come knocking on our door, and we can leave our guilt and our shame, we can leave it in the rubble, and we can never have to look back. Though our sins were as scarlet as that ribbon hanging out of Rahab's window, they have been now made white as snow through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That means you don't have to wear those terrible labels anymore. You get a new label given to you by God, forgiven and accepted and loved and rescued and child of God and redeemed and changed and made new. Those are the labels that God gives you. Perhaps that's why that song Amazing Grace is such an amazing testimony to our lives. We've already talked about that song in this series I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Max Lucado talks about this transitional program that's in Chicago. It's called Grace House. And I think that Grace House has actually expanded to other places around the country. But it's designed for women who are coming out of prison. It's this opportunity for them to get a new life. They all live under the same roof. They all eat the same food at the same table. They seek the same Lord together. They study the Bible. They learn a trade. And most of all, they learn about their new identity. Well, Max Lucado was at a fundraiser of theirs, and they had residents who were giving their testimony at this fundraiser. And one woman had described her past that included prostitution and included drugs and alcohol. She lost her marriage. She lost her children. And ultimately, she had lost her freedom. But then Jesus came knocking on her door. And what stood out to Max was the rhythm in the story that she was telling. She said over and over again, I was, but now. I was on drugs, but now I'm clean. I was on the streets, but now now I'm on my feet. I was... But now, that is the chorus of grace. That is how God works. And if it can work for a prostitute named Rahab and turn her into the grandmother of Jesus, then it does not matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter what labels have been put on you. God has a new label for you. It's a label put there, cemented with His grace. And it cannot be removed. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, God's amazing grace can take away all the sin in your life, can remove the shame of your past, and it can carry you into a future filled with hope, filled with promise. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the power of your word. Lord, I thank you for this story that we read in Joshua and that's talked about in the New Testament as well of Rahab. And Father, we do take comfort in knowing that 
you saved her. And we take this comfort knowing that if you saved her, you can save anyone, Lord, and that you can use anyone as you did her father. Lord, I pray that the people in this room who are holding on to those labels that have been put there by the accuser, by our spiritual enemy, the devil, by these other people in their life that don't have their best interests at heart, these other people in their life that don't love them like you do, Lord, I pray that you will give them the strength to rip those labels off, Father, and to to throw themselves at your mercy, to trust you. I pray that by grace, they will find you the Savior that we all have. pray this in Jesus' name.